sponsored by the Archdiocesan Advisory Committee on Science and Technology. Um, some of you may or may not have heard of this AACST, this advisory committee. Um, it was first established by Archbishop Demetrius early on uh, after becoming uh, the Archbishop of America, precisely because he understood the need for the church to be prepared and empowered to respond to uh, developments in the sciences, um, in the natural sciences, in biotech, um, and in information technology. Um, and so what he did is he created a, an advisory committee that is um, called to advise the Holy Synod, our parochial synod. I was gonna say the Holy and Great Council because I'm so used to saying the Holy and Great Council. But it is uh, meant to advise, to offer insight uh, to the members of our parochial synod so that they may then um, better address trends in society. Uh, there are three main subcommittees. There is a subcommittee on bioethics and medical issues. There is a subcommittee on energy, environment, and economics. And there's a subcommittee on uh, physical sciences and advanced technologies. Now, I might uh, please uh, note that we are in the process of reforming, reshaping, and rebranding, and also revitalizing the advisory committee because for much of uh, the past five to 10 years, it has been very dormant. Uh, we have always provided uh, in, uh, a workshop at every clergy lady uh, since the founding of the advisory committee. However, the membership um, structure was such that it was, it, our t hands were pretty much tied in terms of how we would rapidly respond to issues as they developed. Um, we are making this advisory committee, Gail Wallachak, who is executive um, secretary and I, as well as with his eminence, and uh, some past members and current members of the AACST are working to make this a leaner, meaner, faster machine that can help serve your needs at the parish level. Um, having said this, please allow me now the opportunity to introduce you to our, our panelists. Uh, we heard from Mira. Uh, along with her, we have Father Christopher Bender. Father Christopher is the Dean of St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Cathedral um, in Pittsburgh is, and is a graduate of Yale University and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Mass. After his ordination to the priesthood in 1984, Father Chris served uh, parishes in Lowell, Massachusetts, East Pittsburgh, Mor Morgantown, West Virginia, and most recently, Alquipa, Pennsylvania. I don't know if I'm saying that right. A strong advocate for the ecumenical movement, he has represented his national church, the Archdiocese, in the areas of environmental ministry and social justice and advocacy at the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA since 1997. He is currently serving as chair of the NCC Justice and Advocacy Commission. He also chairs the Orthodox Fellowship of the Transfiguration, also known as OFT, a national ministry which offers leadership in the area of creation care. In August 2013, Father Christopher was appointed hierarchical vicar of the central region of the metropolis of Pittsburgh by His Eminence Metropolitan Savas. Um, he is also secretary of the spiritual court of his region. Father uh, Bender is married to Dr. Filiza Khadzivasiliu, Khadzivasiliu Bender, I'm sorry, of Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, a nephrologist on the faculty of the University of uh, Pittsburgh Medical School. They have two daughters, Sophia and Maria. Um, next to Father Chris is, doc, uh, is it Dr. George or just George? Just George. <laughs> well, it is Dr. George Nassos. Uh, Dr. George Nassos is principal of George P. Nassos and Associates, a consulting company focusing on renewable energy and environmental sustainability. He also leads sustainable energy systems, marketing, uh, and new ways to energy technology. Over the past 14 years, he was industry associate professor and director of the MS in Environmental uh, Management and Sustainability Program at Illinois Institute of Technology's Business School until retirement in 2011. He taught 
the sustainability capstone course uh, since 1999 and has about 30 graduate um, disciples uh, preaching sustainable world, sustainable. Oh, 300, I'm sorry, 300 graduates or disciples preaching sustainable, uh, sustainability worldwide. Many more disciples than Christ had. Prior to academia, he worked 15 years for chemical waste management, developing unique treatment uh, and disposal technologies, and 16 years for International Minerals and Chemical Corp in various uh, managerial positions. The last four years in Germany and the, Netherlands, and the Netherlands. He has written a book based on the capstone course he taught entitled Practical Sustainability Strategies, How to Gain a Competitive Advantage. He is a member of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese and Advisory Committee on Science and Technology, and he has earned a BS, MS, and PhD in Chemical Engineering at Northwestern University, and an MBA uh, from Northwestern Kellogg. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Nassos is uh, Fred Kruger. Uh, Fred, uh, Mr. Frederick Kruger serves as executive coordinator for the National Religious Coalition on Creation Care, NRCCC, and executive director for the Orthodox Fellowship of the Transfiguration. He has previously served as director for the Christian Society of the Green Cross, and as the executive director of the North American Conference on Christianity and Ecology. Professionally, Kruger has worked as a Serbian linguist and a, as a Russian intelligence analyst for the National Security Agency, as political campaign manager, as clergyman, <coughs> magazine editor, author, and wilderness guide. He operates tropical uh, reforestation projects in Guatemala and Belize, conducts dialogues with the White House and campaigns for the U.S. Congress, organizes the annual National Prayer Breakfast for Creation Care, conducts conferences on the spiritual lessons uh, of wilderness, and now plans a series of expeditions to articulate a religious ethic of the oceans. He lives with his wife and teenage daughter in Santa Rosa, California. And up on the screen, that little dot up there, the little uh, uh, Lego person, is Maria Canelo, Canelo Pulu. Uh, Maria, can you hear us? She's, she's on there now. Oh, there we go. Now we can see you, Maria. Maria is a researcher and writer and the founder of Save Greek Water, a citizen's initiative for the non-privatization of water in Greece, whose members are all volunteers. She has studied mathematics and opera singing in Athens and Italy, and apart from her work in communication, she has a second career in classical music. She has collaborated with several organizations as a data researcher, and she has also worked for several Greek media outlets, radio, magazine, and newspapers, as a contributor and editor-in-chief. She has also worked as a communications and project manager on EU-funded programs. Since July of 2012, she has been coordinating the campaign against the privatization of water in Greece, a symbolic fight for the protection of water as a commons and of the human right to water. Uh, Maria, welcome, and uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you very much uh, for being part of our panel this, uh, I was gonna say this morning, but this afternoon. I work for the international, an international project called the Blue Communities Project, which is aimed at promoting solutions to this big crisis that we're facing in the world today, the global water crisis. And we promote solutions from, a perspective, from the perspective of those who are most impacted by this crisis. Um, we support frontline struggles to stop the abuse of our watersheds. We promote fair and environmentally uh, sustainable management of water. We campaign to ensure that the most vulnerable and marginalized communities have access to their fair share of the Earth's fresh water supplies. Now, I know other panelists today will be talking about, uh, we'll be providing statistics on the dire state of fresh water supplies in the world today. So I won't go into that, but what I'd like to emphasize is that we look at this problem from, uh, we see it as a political problem and a moral problem, not simply as a naturally occurring environmental crisis. Um, we, you know, we, we believe and we know that uh, it's not a question of whether or not the earth has sufficient supplies of fresh water to meet people's needs. It's that we don't have sufficient water, we do have sufficient water to meet uh, the needs of our growing population, it, but we do not have sufficient water supply, fresh water supplies to meet uh, the needs or the, the greed of the dominant economic 
uh, model, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here a, a saying by Gandhi, who said, "There's enough to feed. There's enough on the planet for human need, but not enough for human." Uh, greed. Um, and uh, basically, we're dealing with an economic system that places the accumulation of wealth above all else. And this is what is sucking our, 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 our lakes and rivers dry. This is what's draining our aquifers. Um, because as the, the world uh, runs out of fresh water, what's happening is that we have, um, through trade agreements, through uh, austerity measures, as we're seeing in Greece and other parts of Europe, through loan packages um, that we're seeing um, promoted by our by international financial institutions, the uh, governments are being forced to rewrite the rules of freshwater distribution to ensure that the world's wealthiest corporations have secure access to freshwater supplies. And it doesn't matter what they're producing. They could be producing uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle bottled water, gold, silver, biofuels. It doesn't matter how much we need these goods that they're producing. The purpose of this system is to ensure continued accumulation of wealth, no matter what. Um, there's a famous geographer, some of you may know him, David Harvey, who refers to this process as a uh, process of accumulation by dispossession. And the emphasis there is that we need to dispossess in order to ensure continued accumulation. Um, and we, we, we mustn't kid ourselves. This isn't a system, this isn't about economic growth for the betterment of everyone. It's about um, the accumulant, uh, accumulation of wealth for a small minority to the detriment of everyone else. Um, and uh, as, as uh, uh, the Blue Planet Project, we are part of a global movement that is challenging this theft of freshwater supplies. Um, and we are doing this in a variety of different ways. I won't have time to discuss all of those different strategies with you, but would like to, before I leave, talk to you about one of the things that we're working on. Um, we've been supporting campaigns for the public control of water and sanitation services. Um, and this has been vital in communities around the world to ensure that water and sanitation services are publicly managed, democratically controlled, and accountable to the communities who they serve. And we've seen this in the US and in Canada where privatization um, allows for big corporations to tap into this sector. Uh, we have strong drinking water systems in Canada and the US that were built by public funds and corporations therefore benefit when they come into the sector and try and make profits from what we consider to be basic human needs. Um, so and where privatization has occurred, rates have gone up, the quality of services have diminished, and accountability to the public is severely undermined. Um, and so there are many ways in which communities are doing this. Uh, we have a colleague from Greece who will be talking to you later about how they're doing this in Greece. But I would like to just leave you with the story of a project that we started a few years ago in Canada called the Blue Communities Project. It's a, it's a project um, that was aimed at providing municipalities with the tools that they need to assert their right to publicly manage water and sanitation. So we've helped municipalities pass laws um, to, uh, to declare their water and sanitation services um, public, to ban the sale of bottled water in public and municipally run facilities, because bottled water is a completely useless product here in Canada, um, as it is in many parts of the US, um, and to recognize the human right to water and sanitation. Um, so currently in Canada, we have 18 blue communities across the country um, and recently, the project went global with Bern, Switzerland becoming a blue community, Cambodia, Brazil becoming a blue community, and most recently in March, the city of Paris became a blue community. Um, so now we're working with friends in Greece, Spain, Germany, and also around the Great Lakes in the US to promote the Blue Communities Project. And I would like to uh, invite you as engaged and well-informed uh, US citizens to also join the struggle in this project. Um, uh, by encouraging your own local uh, governments to, to, to make your community a blue community. Um, there's information on how to do this on our website. You can go to uh, canadians.org slash blue communities, canadians.org slash blue communities, or you can uh, talk to, uh, to Nick about, uh, Nick or Father Nathaniel, about how to get in touch with me, and I can work with you um, to help that happen. Thank you for this opportunity. I can see my, my plane arriving through the window right now, so I'm going to go aboard that plane. But thank you, and, if, and I'll stay in touch with, uh, with others. So if you have questions, I'd love to be in touch, um, at least virtually. Your Excellencies, the Reverence, dear fathers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored to be talking to you on this, uh, on this evening about the threats to human rights to water in Greece, uh, which unfortunately become apparent again now 
after the signature of the third memorandum deal of the Greek government uh, with its creditors. Uh, this new deal puts again the privatization of water companies in Greece in the list of demands, despite the referendum of Thessaloniki and the Supreme Court decision that ruled that the privatization is unconstitutional. Before continuing, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Church of Greece for the work they have done all this period of the crisis. Uh, you may know about the food kitchens, but the church has been actively involved in ensuring the access of people to the water services. Uh, we know that there have been many occasions where local parishes have helped gather money to pay water and electricity bills of economically vulnerable families, and we are all very grateful for that. Uh, paying the bills of water is valuable for the people in economic distress, However, the Orthodox Church can use its influence and prominence at international level to ensure that such a humanitarian task is not needed anymore by ensuring that the implemented policies are not a threat to the human right to water. And I will try to show, in short, to describe why water privatization is such a threat in Greece. Uh, as you may already know, since the start of the bailout to deals, a lot of pressure was exercised on successive Greek governments to privatize the two biggest publicly controlled water companies of the country, ADAP in Athens and AAP in Thessaloniki. These companies are modernized, they are profitable, they are already in the stock market, they have one of the cheaper tariffs per cubic meter in Europe, and they have tried to adopt corporate social responsibility policies and social tariffs to facilitate uh, those facing economic hardship uh, without, however, and this is something that we're very critical about, uh, stopping uh, the water cuts, which is a true problem for many people. Uh, even now, and despite the starting tariff of 0 0.35 euro per cubic meter, there are already people in great difficulty of paying their water bills. So one can only imagine what will happen if the privatization moves forth. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with privatization consequences, let me just very briefly mention that the international experience has shown that apart from other negative consequences in water quality, infrastructure maintenance, broken promises of investment, etc., one main result of privatization is the unjustifiable increase in tariffs, which leads inevitably to more water cuts if the citizens are not protected by legislation, as in some cities in Europe. So the story of water privatization in Greece begins with the first bailout deal and the law 4046 of 2012, where AVAP and AF, the two water companies, are mentioned many times as assets to be privatized in pages from 666 to 682. In July 2012, Safe Greek Order uh, is founded by myself and a close group of fellow thinkers in order to give this symbolic fight for water as a commons and to stop the water privatization plans in a very challenging political environment, as we knew for a fact that this decision was not one that the Greek government took on its own, but it was rather the result of pressure from the creditors' part. After two and a half years of everyday work at local, national, and European level, we managed together with other organizations in Athens and Thessaloniki and a lot of sensitized citizens to stop the privatization procedure. Uh, unfortunately, there is no time to explain in my brief intervention the specifics of our campaign and the strategies that we used. I will only say that it was based on technocratic documentation and argumentation, planning, a lot of passion, and long hours of volunteer work by a group of professionals of different expertise, such as communication, law, economics, IT, graphic designing, translation, and more. By May 2014, and among a convinced public opinion, which was totally against this failed policy, there were two major events that I would like to mention. The one was a water referendum in Thessaloniki, and the second was a publication of the long-awaited decision of the Supreme Court regarding the constitutionality of the procedure. The referendum was organized by grassroots movements and the mayors of Thessaloniki on May 18th of 2014, which was the first Sunday of the local elections. Just one day before, the government tried to ban the referendum. 
This has created big outcry from citizens. And despite the government's threats for prosecutions, the participation was massive. More than 218,000 Thessalonians waited in queues for hours under the heat, hot sun in order to vote, and the result was an astounding 98% no to the privatization of the Thessaloniki Water Company. This built, of course, immense political pressure in Greece and also at European level. But in these challenging for democracy times in Greece, this democratic procedure could have been really ignored if it was not the Supreme Court historic decision with the number 1906 of 2014, which was published by the State Council coincidentally one day before the referendum. Contrary to the referendum, the court decision referred to the Athens Water Company and it ruled that its privatization was unconstitutional. The decision was based on the ground that the convert of AVAP into a private company conflicts not only uh, formally, but also essentially, with Article 5 um, of this Constitution, which guarantees the right to health, and Article 21, which stipulates the state shall ensure the citizens' health. In the decision, there is also mention of the monopolistic nature of water services and on AVAP's exclusive right to provide water services and drainage in the wider area of Attica, a right which is not transferable by law. After analyzing the Supreme Court decision, we all felt very much that the case was closed, and in a way it was for a while since the government of that uh, era announced it would respect it, and it, it also announced it would freeze both privatizations. It wouldn't uh, move on with them. Uh, a few months ago, with the signature of the third bailout agreement, we were shocked and appalled to find out that the demands of the, for the privatization remain despite the democratic and juridical processes. The two pillars of the rule of law seemed to be suddenly irrelevant to those taking the decisions. The new threats this time are two. First, there is the already approved by the government commitment for the sale of the 11% of AVAT stocks in the stock market and the 23% of AF stocks, leaving the state with the control of just the 50% of the two companies a decision which may be permitted by the court decision, but it is nonetheless against the public interest, since it is not justifiable nor needed in economic terms, and in our estimate, it is just a means of foreign interest in interests entering the board of directors. And second, and more serious, of course, is the threat of the transfer of both water companies in one of the subsidiaries of the newly founded super fund a monstrous private organism where most of the remaining assets of the Greek state have been inserted. This new super fund is entitled Hellenic Company of Assets and Participations, SA, and in the draft of the bill, Article 198, AF and AVAP appeared initially among those publicly controlled companies which would be transferred in their entirety to one of the four subsidiaries, EDHS, Company of Public Participations, SA. Although the companies were withdrawn before the ratification of the bill, there is no commitment of the government that they will not be inserted in the future. And actually, this past Sunday, there were reports in newspapers that the creditors are pushing for this to happen during this summer. If they do finally get entered to the super fund, the two water companies will cease to be public utility agencies with the objective of providing uninterrupted and quality services. They will be instrumentalized in a contradictory to their scope way, since they will become by law simple assets in EDHS portfolio and will serve the super fund's specific scope which as mentioned in article 185 is to contribute resources to implement the investment policy of the country and to contribute to the fulfillment of financial obligations of the Greek Republic. Furthermore, the two companies will be privatized in violation of the constitution because the super fund, as mentioned in article 184, does not belong to the public or broader public sector in the way that it is defined. 
Of course, management and administration of the two companies will be controlled in substance and form by the creditors, taking into account first that the supervisory board of the super fund consists of five members, two of which are appointed by the creditors with the consent of the Minister of Finance, and three from the Greek government, however, with the consent of the creditors. And second, of course, we've seen between the borrower, Greek state, and the creditors that there is no equal footing since the latter may impose what they want, as it has repeatedly de been demonstrated in the past. So from our experience, we're afraid that the transfer of the two companies to the new super fund will result in further commercialization of the commons of water, increase of tariffs and neglect of investments in infrastructure and networks, increase in the number of citizens who might end up in risk of losing their human right uh, to access to water and sanitation, as this was established by the UN, uh, with the valuable, with your valuable help, uh, the loss of control on the decision making regarding the country's water policies and planning, taking into account that uh, these two companies have strategic importance and expertise uh, to, to, to do this task, and of course, the installment of opaque concession contracts, as it has been already the case in Berlin and elsewhere, at the expense of the public interest once more, as these contracts often contain terms such as profits, guarantees, etc. We are really very worried about uh, this new turn. We are planning to fight any such decision at courts in Greece and perhaps internationally, if it is feasible. And we would be honored and empowered to have the church and the Greek American and Greek Canadian community on our side. I would really thank you very much for your attention and patience hearing me out uh, through this digital means. Uh, and I will be at your disposal for more details and clarifications whenever you may wish to find out more about this issue. Thank you very much for your attention. Right, uh, Father Christopher, um, I'm gonna pass the mic down to you. Thank you very much, Father Nathaniel, and also thank you, Maria, for your presentation. Thank you very much. I thought that I would present to you some thoughts that are based on an examination of the role that water plays in the Bible. And that so Bible, and looking first of all, at the Holy Scriptures and then at life, our life as it is lived today. And I, I think of this as God's gift and humanity's response. Water, it turns out, is a very, very important element that is, of course, it is key to our survival. We're 80% water. Uh, we, uh, and the water is salt water within our body. So reflecting the, um, that life on Earth began in the oceans. Now, if we look in the very first chapter of Genesis, we read that the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And here we find, uh, from that point on, that references to water abound in the Holy Bible. So from the very first verse, and actually to the very last chapter of, of Revelation, we will see references to water. Water is the source of life and sustenance. In Genesis, water brings forth the first living creatures. That's in Genesis uh, 1, 20 to 22. The Garden of Eden is full of life-sustaining trees, including the tree of life, that are watered by a stream that wells up from the earth, in Genesis 2. In Deuteronomy 8, we learn that a good land has brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. That is, this is what uh, Moses said to the, uh, to the children of Israel about the promised land. We learn that a good land, or excuse me, in Psalm 104, which is repeated every day at Orthodox Vesper services, the sea abounds with all sorts of life, including Leviathan, which you form to frolic there. This is a speaking to God. And water sustains life and allows it to prosper. In the case of Leviathan, it is a, uh, the reference is to a creature that uh, has a, no connection to uh, humanity in the sense that it's, it was, it's not a, uh, we're not quite sure, we think it perhaps was a whale, but the point I here is that there was no conception at the time that the psalm was written that that animal had any benefit whatsoever to 
to the human race. Its purpose was what the purpose that God had given it, which is described here so that it can have fun in the ocean, which I think is a fantastic way to think about it. But uh, the point really isn't that. It's that you see, I the point here is that every creature on Earth has a reason why it's here. And it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, mean that that reason is something be in service to humanity. Water, then, uh, is something holy, a gift from God. Now, this sense of water as something holy grows even more overt in the New Testament. Thus, water in the hands of John, the forerunner, be brings forgiveness of sins. While it is sanctified for all time when Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, submits to be baptized by his cousin to fulfill all righteousness. And so the point there is that whereas he, John the Baptist called uh, the people to, the wa to be baptized and to, uh, as a sort of to wash away their sins, since the Lord himself had no sin, he had no reason to be baptized for that purpose. However, by submitting to be baptized, he in essence sanctified the waters for all time. And therefore, when we baptize in obedience to his uh, command, uh, uh, our flocks, we are doing so in order to convey to them the blessing, that sanctification that the Lord has already accomplished by being baptized himself in the Jordan. And uh, so that is one of the uh, very uh, important ways in which we understand the role of water in our salvation. Now, water is so precious that the Lord used, uses it as a metaphor for the giving of the Holy Spirit, both when he speaks to the woman at the well in Samaria and also when he speaks of himself as the source of living water. Thus, in John 4, he tells a Samaritan woman, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in John 7, he proclaims as he is teaching the temple, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now, John goes on to, to explain, the, the, the evangelist, now this he said about the spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive after Jesus' glorification. And that glorification was not long in coming, for the Lord's crucifixion was, in fact, his hour of glory. Now, at that moment, which is the fulcrum of all history, an instrument of torture and death became the source of our salvation. The wood of the cross, a product of seed, soil, and water, is revealed as the tree of life, and the blood of the lamb, as it waters the earth, redeems us from our sins. Christ's glorious three-day resurrection signals the defeat of sin and death and the beginning of the transfer transfiguration of the world into God's kingdom, which shall be consummated at the end of time. And, of course, it began with his own resurrection. Finally, we may recall the river that flows from the throne of God in the New Jerusalem, depicted in the last chapter of Revelation. Then the angel showed me that John is, is speaking of his vision. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's in Revelation 22. Water is associated, then, with the origin of life, Genesis, with the perpetuation of life, with fruitful life, with renewal of life through forgiveness of sins, and with eternal life. Water nourishes the tree at life at the beginning of time and at the end of time. The leaves of the tree bring healing to the nations because Christ's sacrifice on the cross is born rich fruit by redeeming all the peoples of the earth and indeed redeeming the entire universe from corruption, sin, and death. We've been noticed that John depicts both the Father and the Son sitting on thrones. But where is the Holy Spirit? Let us consider the river that flows from beneath God's throne. In line with the imagery twice repeated in John's Gospel, perhaps it is none other than the living water of the Holy Spirit bringing solace and healing to a suffering humanity. In this case, the transfiguration of nature has been completed, and water has found its true telos as the ultimate source of spiritual healing. 
To be sure, though, water has another aspect, which is actually closer to what, the, what we're focusing on today. It can bring death as well as life. When there is too much, as in the great flood of Noah, or when there is too little, in the, as in the time of Jeremiah, when a great drought tri crippled Judah. But these events, when they're uh, from the perspective of, of people's perception that there was an act of God, are understood more or less as a just rebuke from God for the sins and recalcitrance of the people. In the case of the great flood, because of the exceeding wickedness and depravity of all of humanity, and in the case of the great drought, because of the apostasy and iniquity of the rulers and the inhabitants of Judah. Scriptural witness also, though, tells us that God considers it our duty to make clean water accessible to all because it is a basic human need. In Ezekiel 38, the prophet speaks the word of the Lord, that is, harsh words against the shepherds of Israel, that is, the ruling class, which has oppressed the common people referred to as the sheep. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture? and to drink of clear water that you must foul the rest with your feet. In this case, the focus is changed. God speaks of how the powerful and selfish among humans abuse the gifts of the earth, including polluting otherwise potable water. In Job 24, the protagonist claim, complains about the injustices that the poor suffer at the hands of those who hold power over them, including depriving them of enough to drink. They tread the wine, wine presses, he says, but suffer thirst. It seems to me that this uh, description could very easily uh, be uh, fit the uh, dilemma or the plight of our farm workers working in the hot summer sun. And often we hear stories about their, that they're not uh, given sufficient time or, a, or access to adequate water to, and, and, and ways to, um, uh, so that they can tolerate what they, the, uh, their difficult working conditions during the day. <clears throat> In Isaiah 32, the prophet labels as iniquity depriving the thirsty of drink. Similar to the Son of Man in the parable of the sheep and the goats in the New Testament says that refusing to provide drink to those who are thirsty will be among the crimes which will deserve eternal punishment at the last judgment. In the latter cases, we understand that it's no longer an act of God that deprives people of water, but rather human agency. Water is no longer a source of blessings, but rather a curse. In our day, we see this evil multiplied a millionfold. Each year, human ignorance and irresponsibility condemns untold uh, numbers of men, women, and especially children to suffering and death through preventable waterborne diseases. The absence or deterioration of adequate public water systems compounds the problem. The lack of proper sanitation, especially in big cities in the developing world with their slums and shanty towns, exacerbates the problem. Gra graft and corruption sap urgently needed funds away from projects that could have gone into constructing or, re uh, uh, constructing or repairing sewage systems. New dams are being built by numerous countries for agricultural and energy purposes that, in the remarkable efficiency, deprive residents of other countries downstream of their only source of water for drinking and farming. We will hear much more, I'm sure, about these matters from our other presenters. Suffice it to say here that such injustices may perceive, may, may result from policies that privilege profit and greed over the protection of people. We per perhaps we per perceive a whiff of the demonic over the stench of untreated sewage and uncollected garbage. Not all human growth and change, we must remind ourselves, is towards the good and the light of Christ. Sometimes, no often, the opposite is true. And recently I, I was reading about a situation, for instance, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, where the millions have come to live in the city, and, but they don't have proper sanitation. They live in uh, very uh, difficult conditions. They have no sewage system whatsoever. When they go to the bathroom, they use a, um, a plastic bag, and then they just throw it in the street, and that eventually enters into the water system, and then that's the same water that they, at another point, they'll go and drink from the river or whatever, or the well, which is polluted because of the uh, prevalence of these things. And it's not surprising, therefore, that there's an awful lot of illness 
uh, that is totally preventable because either, as in the newer neighborhoods, there is no sewage system, or in older neighborhoods, it exists, but it is not in proper repair. It, the government just simply does not give that a high priority. I'd like to contrast here the open arms of the Lord embracing all of humanity, which we witness on the cross, because he said, it, I, when I lift it up, will draw all men to myself. And as opposed to the stop signal from the private sector with regard to, in other words, don't know, you may not have this unless you can afford it, where the concern is first for profit and then only secondly for the benefit of the customers. What can we do about any of this? From the point of view of our faith, I believe that it requires, first of all, mitania. Mitania means a change of mind or a, a uh, revision in the, our understanding of things. And it, the understanding in this case is our recognition that all, what matters ultimately is not the accumulation of wealth and power, which we can't take with us, but rather our relationship with God in whom we live and move and have our being, as St. Paul said. We must move from a point of view that is based on individualism and greed to one where we cooperate with God to respond to human need in, in the larger community. The one, I think, of, of the great challenges of our time is, in fact, the, the how, how individualistic we have become as a society. I think it's a problem because when we, when we come to be extreme individualists, then it makes it possible for us simply to have the welfare of other people is, is not even something to think about. All, all we need to worry about is ourselves. It, this, when taken to an extreme, can cause grave ill because it, it it removes any sense of any moral sense that we have a duty to our neighbors in need, which is a part of being human or has been up until our time. And I believe that this is in our day a very serious matter because the, um, uh, the emphasis on individualism is something which is permeates especially American society, but Western societies in general. And um, it is, it, it sometimes becomes a stumbling block to our efforts to do anything uh, as a community in order to uh, uh, improve uh, the welfare of our people. And so I'm not necessarily, I don't, I don't believe in socialism as a solution here. I just simply think that uh, what, what we are accustomed to traditionally, both in, as in our country and also, in, for instance, in, in Greece, is that people lived in communities where there was accountability. There was accountability to your, the other members of your own family. There's accountability from parents to their children and children to their parents. There was accountability to other members of your neighbors, who often whom were also your friends and relatives. There was accountability to the larger community. And, and I think that the, the, the development, of, for instance, of um, public water systems what is a reflection of this sense of duty or accountability that, that existed uh, and really has done an amazingly wonderful, excellent job in terms of providing clean water in many, many places. And, but whenever that sense of community begins to go away, then it's, and uh, the local government is struggling to find extra funds, one of the easiest ways to do that is to sell off the water system. And so what happened in Greece has happened here in our country time and again. I know that in West Pennsylvania, uh, and in Pennsylvania in general, this is a, a burning issue uh, because people are finding that once the water uh, systems are privatized, uh, all sorts of problems begin that they didn't have before and uh, related to different policies. So I hope that uh, then I don't really have solutions to offer here in practical terms. I hope that, uh, there, that we might hear from some from our other panelists. 
All I know is that we must become instruments of God's justice to give voice to the voiceless and work through our elected representatives to stop the worst abuses. No one can live without water, yet in too many places, human beings cannot live with the poison water they are compelled to drink either. And in others, their only sources of water are drying up completely. Clearly, we have much work to do if we are to fill our Lord's command, even from afar, to give something to drink to those who thirst. Let us begin. I think our vision, this is the way His All Holiness always begins. He articulates the vision, the Orthodox Christian vision of creation, and that simply, in Him, we live and move and have our being. Uh, who art everywhere present and fillest all things. And from that, everything else will devolve because that implies that everything is within God and for God and to God. So that the church has been here before. What we are doing is not something new, but we are recovering the traditional ethic of the Orthodox Church, particularly in the first millennium. And we see this in monastic practice. In St. Benedict, he was so concerned about preserving our way of life that he gave as a rule for all monastics that they were to treat the implements of the barnyard and everything that came through, uh, through their hands with the same holy regard as the implements of the altar. In other words, it's not just respect, but it's a sacramental action. And we see this at the first time when persecutions began to be lifted in North Africa, right after the reign of Diocletian. And he said, we must now, because here we are, we're surrounded by Jews and by Medes and by the ancient uh, Greek religion and uh, the pagan Egyptians. And he said, we must artic articulate a way of life. And so in Christ our educator, he begins to lay out a Christian way of living, something for the household. And where does he begin? With food and drink. He begins with food and drink because that is the lifestyle. It begins there and Christ teaches us if we will search the scriptures. So if we look at what those scriptures have to say, going through it very quickly, the, the, the principles that guide our behavior. And so the first thing in scripture is dominion. Now that's the, the Hebrew word rada. And when you are submitting to rada, it is you stand as a king, but the king represents the Lord. And so he has the actions of the Lord and the intent of the Lord and the mind of the Lord in such a way that the person who the church gives us as the model of dominion is the prophet Elijah. And what does the prophet Elijah do? But he masters, he has dominion over his own interior appetites and thoughts. And everything is submitted to God. So that that tells us how we begin in Genesis 1. But what follows from that immediately is the concept of replenishing. We are told to have dominion and replenish the earth. Now this is the Hebrew word blah. It's an ML and no vowel, but it's a vowel that's not articulated. And that means to put back what you take. We have translated it as fill, and, and yes, that's true, but to fill it with the way it has been. So that if we are to relentlessly practicing the concept of replenishment, why that's recycling. That's the orthodox basis for recycling, is to replenish, but to put back everything so that, as a principle, we are to maintain the original fruitfulness of the creation. And so that if we were to practice this, population is not a problem, because everything is circular rather than an economy of extraction. That's what we have today. We have an extraction, uh, an economy of taking, but we don't have the other side of it, the reciprocal side of putting back in accordance to what we take. So if we were to have an orthodox economy, it would have this circular uh, recycling uh, reciprocal quality. And so the very next tasks that appear in the scriptures are to dress and keep. Uh, these are the Hebrew words avad and shamar. 
And it's agricultural terms. You plant something and you're very careful to raise it up. But you're also, the shamar is to protect it from any harm. And so that's the command to avoid pollution. St. Basil, in his commentary on this, says this is the command to raise creation to its full cosmological potential. And so all this takes place in the context of covenant, where all those original commands in the garden, they're repeated by Noah. And then what follows in Leviticus, God gives to Moses specific rules for the maintenance of clean water. And he says, you may not drink polluted water. Uh, for instance, if anything is dead that falls into the water, that is uh, prohibited. And so the kosher laws continue to reflect that. Uh, but there is a detailed commentary, uh, Leviticus 11, 33 to 38. It's all about clean water and, and abiding by those rules. And yet at the same time, we know the whole earth is the Lord's. We see that in, in St. Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, but particularly in Psalm 24, 23. The earth is the Lord's and therefore it is not ours. Therefore, we are stewards. Uh, now in Ezekiel, it's very specific. You can drink of the water, but you may not pollute it. You can bring your cattle to drink of the water, but you may not allow them to muddy the water. We can extrapolate from that a whole ethic of maintaining the purity of water. We know this is important because today, three and a half million children die every year because of polluted water. Half of the beds in the third world are in hospitals because of polluted water. And it's much more than the mortality figure because there is so much sickness. Uh, in the United States, we have lead poisoning, which means people become forgetful in about 5% of the water systems. But uh, there are so many diseases. For instance, as All Holiness emphasizes the responsibility of pastors for the health of the congregation. And he particularly cites the cancers and the heart diseases, which we know 70 to 90%, according to the American Cancer Society, are due to toxins in the environment. And so what do you do? You emphasize clean food. You emphasize removing those hazardous products, particularly uh, the detergents that work their way into the parish life. These things do not need to take place at the rate that they're doing if we are observant. Now here's a very interesting one that we wouldn't associate with water, but in uh, the Beatitudes, uh, we hear every Sunday that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now what does that mean? Well, St. Maximus the Confessor, as he interprets this, he says, well, in the descent of the Logos, when you are particularly receptive, there's a word called akaluthia, when you reflect on that descent, you begin to embrace the virtues, and the virtues are the way that it, the, the Logos begins to manifest in people. It's all those qualities of godliness. And those qualities of godliness are the bridge that we have within ourselves to Jesus Christ, who's the epitome of the virtues. And of course, that applies to water because we need to have a thankfulness for it, a respect for it, even a love that this is a gift from God. And so we respect it and we protect it as we're told way back in Genesis from any form of pollution. Um, uh, we see that in uh, the book of Isaiah uh, 24 and 25 where we see all these plagues filling the earth and it's because of sin. And so repentance is essential for the next chapter where it becomes a land of milk and honey. So that the condition of the environment is an in out picturing of what's inside people, their human nature. Now, his all holiness has been abundant in talking about this. He has given us the f uh, a number of things, a whole lexicon of commentary. He says we're united by water, which comprises 70% of our body and 70% of the Earth's surface. There's a correspondence. 
that water cradles us from birth, it sustains us in life, it heals us in sickness, uh, enlivens our spirit, purifies our body if it's clean, and refreshes our mind. And so, but he also says, for humans to contaminate the earth's <coughs> waters, its land and its air, with these poisonous substances, these things are sins. But people haven't been educated to the extent that they will confess, uh, I did the so and so with the water, or I did so and so with land. But this is the extension of our theology into the creation, doing on earth as it is in heaven, which is our model and which we pray every day. So that uh, his all holiness has a lot of commentary. And all of it is a recovery. It's not new. We have been here before, but because we came into a Protestant worldview where there's a separation from God and the creation. That's why they say God's up there. Well, that's not an orthodox view. And so he tells us we should propagate. I'm reading from his All Holiness. An ecological ethic reminds us the world is not ours to use as we please. It is a gift of God. It's an obligation to return that love, thine own of thine own in whatever responsibility that entails, so that we are developing a new field of missionary activity. It is a missionary to culture. To, you know, we're told in uh, Mark 16, go forth into the whole cosmos, literally, uh, and preach the good news to every living creature. Well, we haven't understood how you preach it to every living creature, and so we have reinterpreted that as the people and the nations. But there is a radiation of, a, of one's attitude. This is why clergy teach more by who they are than what they say. And so, a Christian radiates it. There is a teaching in the light and the love and the life of the Lord as it's embraced. And that is transforming. And that is where we have to go. And so this missionary uh, venture then is a recreation of what St. Clement of Alexandria saw when there was all this, uh, the different religions and the way to teach was not so much by words but by actions but by living in accord with the nature of God, with the nature of life, that it would then radiate. And then they were able to bring about Christian dump. That whole area was converted. That's a, a discussion. I'm gonna go quicker because I see the time is running out. So that, uh, can you imagine if there were 110 full school buses that ran over the cliff and all of them died today, 110 school, and that happened every day of the year. That gives you an idea of the immensity of the water crisis. And so what are we going to do? That it begins with a respect. It begins by realizing the extent of the problem for more people die every year from bad water than from all the wars, from all the violence, and from all those different accidents that happen. It's bigger than all of that, which is why water is, is so important. And so what we have then as guidelines, we have to respect it as a gift from God. We have to drink clean water. Make sure that you don't serve tap water that's loaded with chlorine and everything else, but you have a water filter. Um, you want to avoid nitrogen, nitrogen fertilizers on your lawns. Uh, here's one that you might not guess. Stop eating beef. It's so much more expensive, not financially, but to the whole world. For instance, it takes 25 gallons of water to produce a pound of tomatoes, 
but it takes 5,000 gallons to produce a pound of beef. And at the same time, there are implications for climate change. Uh, there's a whole other range of issues. It's the containers. Plastic for water becomes a, a gender bender uh, that people today are becoming confused. Am I a this or a that? And it's because there are estrogens in the food, uh, I'm sorry, in the containers that leak out and that mimic estrogen. And so the scientists who really found that, it's Dr. Fred Von Saul at the University of Missouri, he called his wife and said, get every bit of plastic out of our house because it's going to contaminate the children. It's going to harm them more than any benefit that comes. Uh, there's a whole discussion there about bender, gender bending chemicals. But minimize water use, respect it. Uh, post notes in the church about water conservation, which is a form of respect, restraint. And find those methods of low flow technology and proper plumbing so you don't, and make sure you get rid of all the lead because uh, it causes memory loss, that water that goes through the old lead. In the 1930s, that's all we used to connect pipes together, and it was responsible for a whole series of diseases, including sometimes cancer, uh, in the people of the 50s and the 60s. Thank you, I ran out of time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Uh, being a, a part-time academic, I have to use slides. Um, but what I want to talk about, first of all, is a lot of critical issues in this world. We, we have problem in Syria, a financial problem in Greece, uh, the pending uh, exit of uh, England from the EU, uh, and more recently, shootings in Chicago. The last 15 hours of this three-day weekend, there were 32 shootings just in Chicago. These are very critical issues, but they only affect a small number of people compared to the world population. The degrading of our environment affects every living creature on this earth, and that's why it is so important. Uh, before I get into water, let me put it in perspective. Uh, I, I consider four major environmental issues. Um, one is climate change. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, we had a constant, relatively constant concentration of carbon dioxide of 280 parts per million. Uh, James Hansen, who brought climate change to the attention of the US, said we cannot go over 350 parts per million. And we are already over 400. And in the next 75 years, it'll stay there no matter what we do. Uh, let's look at consumption. Um, the global uh, footprint network determines the amount of biologically uh, productive land and water that we need to provide for every human being for their goods and the assimilation of waste. And we were doing a great job. In 1960, we were using 50% of what the Earth was providing us. Only 20 years later, we were consuming 100% of what the Earth was providing us. 2012, we're a little over one and a half Earths. By 2030, we expect to need, we're going to need two Earths to provide for all human life. And by 2050, the way we're going, we're going to need two and a half Earths. And what's worse is if China and India increase their economy to achieve what the US is doing, we're going to need nine Earths to provide the goods. October, or not October, August 8th is Earth Overshoot Day. What is Earth Overshoot Day? That is the day that we in the United States will have consumed 100% of what the Earth is providing in an entire year. I shouldn't say the US, the whole world. August 8th, 
Last year it was August 12th. Next year it'll probably be August 4th because we're consuming more and more. And one of the major contributions to that is population growth. Uh, just look at, uh, well, it's, it's hard to see. Uh, 1930, we were at 2 billion people. Uh, today, we're about 7.5 billion people. Uh, we've been on this earth an infinitesimal small period of time compared to man being on earth. But in, just in my lifetime, the population of this earth has gone to around from a little over 2 billion to close to 8 billion. And we are increasing at a rate of 10 million people every six weeks. So you see what's contributing to all these other problems. So let's get into water. <laughs> How much water do we have on this earth? You can see that 97% of it is salt water and only 3% is fresh water. And if you take that fresh water, then you can see where most of it is at. Ice caps and glaciers and groundwater. Only th three tenths of 1% of the fresh water is available to us. So if you take 3% times three tenths of a percent, that's 0.01% of all the water on the earth is available to us. And where is it used? 60% for agriculture, 30% for industrial use, and only 10% for human consumption. So look at all those percentages. 0.001% of all the water on Earth is available for humans. And let's take a look at uh, agriculture. It needs to be considerably more efficient. One of the problems is uh, Central Valley. It's a 400-mile strip of land down the center of California that comprises 1% uh, of the farmland in the United States, but provides 25% of our food, just from Central Valley. And why do I mention it? Because in 2014, 240 of the 252 counties in Central Valley were designated as disaster areas for lack of water. Fortunately, we have companies like uh, SAB Miller, that's a beer company, Miller Coors, uh, Unilever, Nestle, Coca-Cola, these are examples of companies that are really concerned about the water situation. Uh, uh, at Miller Coors, water issues are discussed at the board level. Uh, Nestle has about a thousand agronomists that they're paying to help farmers in becoming more efficient with water. Now, maybe one of the answers is hydroponics. Now, what is hydroponics? If you have a lot of farmland and you're growing crops and you have to water it, how much of that water that is sprayed actually gets to the plant? Very small percentage. The rest either goes down into the groundwater or could be evaporated. Hydroponics is where you grow water, you grow plants right in water so you are much more efficient. And what could be the next step after that? is a vertical farm. You may not realize, but from the source of food to the food to your table, the average distance is about 1,500 miles. That's how far food travels to go from the source to your table. There are plans now to put vertical farms in cities. Uh, there's one being planned already for Toronto, and, and other cities. So just imagine if you had a vertical farm that may be 50, 60, 70 stories, and on each level different plants are grown, and the water from one that is not used could go to the next level. Uh, you don't have to have trucks shipping your food. Uh, you don't need tractors, trailers, and the grocery store that sells these could be on the main floor. Uh, 
Let's look at industry, which needs to be more efficient. Uh, Coal-fired power plants, they consume as much water as the needs of a billion people. There are 8,400 power plants in the world, and 44 of the present and 45% of the future power plants, the plan, are in water-stressed areas. Now, what's the answer? Solar and wind, they don't use any water at all. And you might ask, well, how, why do coal-fired power plants need water? What do you do? You burn the coal, creates a lot of heat, the heat takes water, converts it to steam, and the steam drives the turbine generator. And that is lost water. Uh, look at uh, textile. It, it takes 26 to 40 gallons to dye two pounds of textile. Uh, Nike's Taiwan contractor is developing a waterless dyeing system. So we're getting there slowly. Um, another area that's uh, using a lot of water is hydraulic fract fr fracturing. Short term is fracking. And basically what that is is pumping water at high pressure to the subsurface to break up strata of uh, shale and whatever that allows the release of natural gas or oil. And the problem with that is some of that water leaks out and it goes into the groundwater. And what does that look like? I don't know if you could read that. It's the fluid that's going into the fracking, 90% is water, 95% or 9.5% is sand, and what's the rest? Well, it's chemicals like sodium chloride, ethylene glycol, uh, borate salts, sodium carbonate, calcium carbonate, isopropanol. These liquids that are used for fracking contain something like about 100 different chemicals that all have a specific purpose, and they can leak into the groundwater. So fracking is something that wish we wouldn't be doing, and we need to move quicker into renewable energy. But fortunately, some of the water usage uh, is, is actually returned. And this gives you an idea of how much of the water is consumed and how much is uh, returned. Industry consumes 10%, returns 9% to use it over again. Agriculture is the worst. This is where the fact that so much of the water is, is just evaporated or goes into the groundwater. One of the things, uh, and Fred mentioned it earlier, is the actual consumption of water that we need for different products. Something called a water footprint. It, looking at from the beginning of the production of a product to the end, how much water do we use? And take a look at this. A, a cotton t-shirt requires 700 gallons of water. Uh, a cup of coffee. 35%. Cheeseburger, 968 gallons of water, uh, primarily from the meat patty. A pint of beer takes 35 gallons, of which only a half a gallon to produce a pint of beer is at the brewery itself. Where do these numbers come from? Well, it's primarily beef. As Fred mentioned how much water is needed for a pound of beef and it's primarily with the grain that's needed to feed the animal and the water that the animals consume. That gives you an idea of how much water we're, we're using. Uh, and there are companies that, that when they sell grain or trade grain, they're actually trading virtual water, the amount of water that is contained in that grain. China today uh, is lacking a lot of water for their agricultural. They're buying crops from Africa, and basically what's happening is the embedded water, the water that was used to grow the crops in Africa, is being transferred to, to China. Uh, and what's the cost of all this water, the true cost? 
Here's a map that shows you the value of, of water. It's priced in the U.S. dollar per cubic meter. Water is primarily priced per thousand gallons. Uh, or, uh, cubic meter is 264 gallons. So if you multiply these numbers by four, it gives you the price of water per thousand gallons. Uh, and the ironic thing is, as you look at uh, where, where's Chicago, dollar fifty. Uh, Copenhagen, seven dollars thirty-eight. But you go to an area where they're really stressed with water, like the Middle East, three cents. Yeah. And that's a real problem. And if you, I said a, a hamburger is 968 gallons. Let's say it's 1,000 gallons, okay? What is the true cost of a hamburger if you were to actually price the water? In Atlanta, the cost, the true cost of water is $25 for a hamburger. In Chicago, it's $6. New York, $13. Copenhagen, $30. In Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, 12 cents. It really doesn't make any sense. Uh, Fred also mentioned bottled water. Let, let me talk a little bit about bottled water. The U.S. consumption of bottled water has gone from 23 gallons up to 23 gallons per person per year to 34 gallons. <coughs> just a couple years ago. So there's an increase in consumption of bottled water. One of the problems, it takes, for a 12 ounce bottle of water, it takes 24 ounces of water just to make the bottle. Only 30% of bottled, uh, plastic bottles are recycled. And if you look, if you buy bottled water, It'll cost you, believe it or not, per thousand gallons, about $1,500 compared to tap water, which is somewhere that I mentioned, $5 to $25 for tap water, compared to $1,500 for bottled water. And you worry, worry about purity. Bottled water is regulated by the FDA, tap water by the EPA, EPA standards are more stringent than bottled water. And to give you an example, uh, E. coli cannot be uh, found in tap water, but there are small amounts that are allowed per standard the FDA to be in bottled water. And EPA testing is more frequent than bottled water. Uh, one of the problems, Nestle, I said one of the good things that Nestle's doing with the agronomist, Nestle has a, a bottled water plant in Michigan. Uh, they've had it there for a number of years. And where are they getting the water? From the springs, underground springs. Well, they depleted all that water, so there's nothing left. A couple of years ago, Nestle went to Congress and received permission to take water out of Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. So that bottling plant in Michigan is extracting water from Lake Michigan and selling that water to China. Uh, we are, people in the Midwest are spoiled because the Midwest, the Great Lakes represents about 20% of all the available fresh water in the world. Uh, there are 35 states in the United States that are concerned about water in the future. And I'll give you an example. The state of Alabama, Georgia, and Florida have been in the courts fighting for river rights. Georgia tried to move its border so that a river can be part of Georgia. They lost. So those are some of the problems. Uh, what about, what's the answer? One answer is desalination, because I said 97% of salt water. Uh, that is a po possible answer. Uh, 
There are currently 17,000 plant desalination plants in 150 countries. They're mostly in the Middle East. Um, the problem is, in, in the U.S., the, it, desalination costs twice as much as fresh water, uh, primarily because of energy, which 10 times as much as uh, a regular watering plant. Uh, you normally think of desalination by evaporating the water and then condensing it, so you remove the salts. The most common practice is reverse osmosis. Uh, but that still needs a lot of energy because it's a pressure type system. The largest plant in the Western Hemisphere was just completed and went into effect uh, last year. It's in Carlsbad, California. So we're going to have to start using desalination in order to provide water for us. Uh, and here's a photo of the plant in Carlsbad. Um, another answer is we have to become more efficient. You ever stop to think, most of us are, I assume we're staying here in the hotel, or even at home, you think about the fact that the water you use to flush the toilet is the same water that you drink. Does it have to be that clean to flush a toilet? Maybe we ought to do something like this and put a, a sink above the toilet tank. These are two examples. So after you use the toilet, you wash your hands, and that water that you use to wash your hands goes into the toilet tank that could be used for the next flush. So what's happening, you're using the water twice instead of one time before it goes into the sewer system. Uh, these, have, these have been very uh, prevalent in Australia. It's had a uh, water drop for the last 10 years. Or here's another answer, urinals for the mat. After you're through, you have to stay there and wash your hands at the urinal, and the water you use to wash your hands is then goes down and flushes the toilet, the urinal. You won't, you won't find these in the United States. These, these are in Europe. Yes. Because Europe, is, Europe's had problems long before we've had these problems. Uh, but, you know, what, what can we do as individuals? Uh, one is check for leaks. The U.S. infrastructure loses six billion gallons a day of drinking water due to leaks. And you can do the same thing at home, check for leaks. Now, how do you check for a leak? We all have water meters. Look at the water meter. Look at the reading before you go to bed at night. 12 hours later, go look at that water reading again and see if it's changed. If it's changed, you have a water leak somewhere in your house. Uh, install dual flush toilets. Uh, remember our toilets in the U.S. used to be three gallons of flush. They revised it, went down to 1.4. But there are dual flush where you have two buttons. That takes nine tenths to flush liquids and 1.4 to flush solids. You can reduce that way. When you wash clothes or uh, dishes, make sure you have a full load. A Electrolux in, in Sweden was selling uh, washing machines. They decided to change and they leased washing machines. And so you would get a washing machine in your home and you would pay every time you used it. And after so many uses, they take it, give you a new one, and they refurbish it and give it to somebody else. It forced people to use full loads because you were paying per, per load. Uh, take shorter showers. I go to a health club, and I get upset when people are showering for 10 minutes. You know, uh, just a, a waste of water. So basically, just think about these things and don't let water run unnecessarily. Again, at the health club, I see 
people shaving, and while they're shaving, the faucet is on, just running, running, running. So these are some of the things that we need to do because water is very, very critical. Thank you very much for your attention. We do have time for some questions. If uh, there are any questions from the floor uh, for any of our panelists or even Maria, I think she's still on Skype. That's right. I, um, I will just say one thing. I don't know if I should be scared or optimistic with what we heard because that, that slide showing that we need potentially nine Earths to fulfill our consumption, it's, it's very scary because it reminds me of those uh, alien invasion movies where aliens invade our planet because we have water. And at the end of the day, it seems like we will be the ones doing the invading um, based on our own uh, our own needs. So if anyone has any questions? Please. What are we doing in this problem? Well, uh, we're not paying is, attention. Huh? We're not paying attention. No, no. I'm talking about concrete actions that we can be doing today to help people who are without water. I'll give you an example. I worked for 38 years at DuPont. I'm retired. One of my retirees found an organization, and I think it's called Engineers Without Borders, where people who are retired primarily go over and they put water systems in developing countries where they do not have water. What are we doing today other than, no offense, throwing out statistics to make life better for underprivileged and hurting people today? Do we have any programs at all? And if not, why? We I mean, I don't know who the we is. Is it we, the church, we, the, well, the church, the church is responding. I mean, I think um, Maria mentioned that the Church of Greece has been um, involved in yes. protecting the water. Yes. Right, but it's also a humanitarian decision. IOCC is also involved in bringing water and uh, has several water projects around the world uh, that brings fresh drinking water to underserved communities or communities that don't have any water. Um, but I'm sure that there's a lot more we can do. Um, I think one of the main issues is what Fred said, no one is really paying attention, especially in those regions that have the ability to help but also have water. And one of my questions, and it can piggyback to your question, is what will it take, what, what kind of crisis will it take, or do you all estimate, what, you know, what, how bad do things need to get for people to wake up and start making a difference? And it, it may be too late by then, but what um, we see images of children who have died uh, because of lack of water or food, or, and what will it really take for us as a, as a human race to wake up? Well, we have the commandments of God that, first of all, tell us to take good care of this and to be recycling and replenishing, and we don't do it. So we already have the commandments, and we disregard them. Then we're going to see things fall apart. It's very interesting if we look at the book of Revelation, where it begins to show the demons are pouring these plagues upon the earth, and the good angel shows up. And what's the comment from the good angel? Hurt not the earth, neither the seas nor the trees. And then, three, that's Genesis, that's Revelation 7, 3. And then uh, four chapters later, it's the time of the judgment. And it's very interesting uh, the, what the good angel says to the uh, Apostle John. And he says, it's the time of the judgment, and uh, the prophets are going in, and the saints are going in, and even those who fear the word of God. But those that destroy the earth, God will destroy. And so the tradition has understood this as a mercy. If you failed with your neighbor, what did you do to the earth? And so this is an issue for which we will have accountability. And so our responsibility is to do what? Everything that we can. It's not just a list of three or four things. It's a whole attitude towards life. Uh, George might have something further to say. Yeah, one of the things we need to do is, is 
educate. We need to educate people. I, uh, I lived in Germany uh, for three years, uh, almost 40 years ago, working there. And I saw things that were being done in Europe that we don't do today yet. They are so far ahead of us because so many more people in, in a smaller area of land that they have a lot of problems and they're doing something about it. Uh, unfortunately, here in the U.S., we're not doing enough because we're spoiled. Uh, I, I th just like you may hear about uh, putting a price on carbon, uh, a uh, tax and dividend, and, and basically what does that mean for carbon? If you price carbon, that's going to increase the cost of whatever the product is that's uh, emitting the carbon, and then that tax would be distributed to everybody in the U.S. on an equal basis. So those that are energy hogs would lose out, and those who are more efficient would get more money back. It's an incentive for people to be more energy conscious. We could do the same thing with water. Water, water we just, you know, it, it's so inexpensive. Uh, like in Chicago, my, my water bill is about $5 a thousand gallons, uh, which is next to nothing uh, compared to bottled water, which is $1,500. Uh, so we need to educate people to become more aware of, of some of our problems. And we need to talk to a lot of the companies are doing something uh, as much as they can. Uh, we need to talk to our political leaders. You know, carbon, like climate change. The U.S. has done very, very little uh, uh, in terms of climate change, and uh, we're not doing that much for the water either. So, education and getting our our governments to start helping out in this area. I was just wanted to say that. You know, being a good consumer is one thing, but being a good citizen and uh, a good community member is something uh, a little bit more complicated. So I think we shouldn't really uh, focus only on how to, to, to reduce the consumption of water. As we've seen, the human consumption of water, of course, as the professor uh, stated, is a, a tiny bit of the whole consumption. We have right now the problem, the problem as Mira said in the beginning of her uh, speech, it's also political. We have to see the conflict of the different uses, usages of water and really think you know, rationally as to what is most important and where as you know, everybody in humanity can, can turn their focus on. Engineering, of course, and technology must be used uh, to resolve the issue, and the technologies there are, the, as the professor very, uh, very splendidly explained. That is why I think that we should really focus on the political aspect of the problem. The technology is there, the will is there, the people must be engaged so they can um, influence the, the leaders to take uh, the action that is needed to be taken. We have to become again rational and then we will uh, uh, resolve the, the issues all together. Thank you. So thank you very much again for coming. Yeah. And